So uh, if you'll pray with us today, Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us, a day that you have made that we can rejoice and be glad in it. So Lord, everything that we say and do today, Lord, we come to worship you, Lord. We come to lift up the name of Jesus. We come to exalt the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So Father, I pray today, let the presence of your Holy Spirit, God, be in this service this morning. And God, move on our hearts and our lives and everything, God, that would give you the glory and give you the honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand with us this morning and uh, let's get around and shake some hands. I know some have been doing that. Thank you, Jesus.
Philemon chapter 1. I want to read two verses to you this morning. Uh, actually, three. I'm sorry. Three verses this morning, starting at verse number 4. And uh, th I love this particular chapter because it deals with, with Philemon's love and faith for the people and the church. It says that I thank my God always when I remember you in pr my prayers because I hear of your love and all of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And verse 6, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Lord, I pray today that as we look at these verses amongst a few others, I pray today, God, that you would help us to look at the importance of the cross and what the cross is all about. I pray today, God, help us to uh, look at, as we journey in our relationship with you on a daily basis, God, how you're speaking to each one of us as we share our faith. And Lord, I pray today, let the presence of your Holy Spirit continue to transform our life today. And we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk to you about a cross that each one of us must face. Is we're living in a day when the message of the church is ever-changing. Churches and even whole denominations are moving away from the message of salvation and the cross through the blood of Jesus and moving toward a message of salvation sometimes based out of good works and social activism. The old bloody message of the cross is quickly being replaced by a bloodless and powerless message that lacks the power and the hope of changed lives. Instead, people are hearing a message that tells them, I'm okay if you're okay. We're quickly becoming a powerless generation. Charles Crabtree, 15 years ago, when he was working at the national office as the assistant general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, made this statement at one of the general councils. He said that the Pentecostal denomination, especially in the Assemblies of God, is one generation away from extinction. We're living in powerless times because people do not understand and, and grasp the concept of a God that we serve where he said, you will be able to do greater things. We have almost taken the cross and the message of it and have conveniently fixed it to where it becomes comfortable for people to come to Christ. Amen? We live in a comfortable society. We live in a quick society. Everything is quick for us. Well, today, I would like to take that stand that the Apostle Paul took all those years ago. When he wrote to the church in Corinth, Paul reminded them that he had been called for one purpose, and that purpose was to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That message was to be his focus, and the message was to be his ministry. So I want to re state the message. I would like to remind everyone today in this house about what happened that day when Jesus died on that cross at Calvary. I want to help relate, but there's three different opportunities this morning that we're going to look at about this cross. First one is the cross of Christ is a cross of division. It divides between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. In Matthew 26, verses 27 and 28, then he took the cup and he gave thanks, and he went and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Covenant, which is shed for many of the remission of sins. You see, the world despises the cross of Christ. The cross divides the saved from the unsaved. A person cannot be saved from their sin unless they trust in the cross of Jesus Christ. We must trust in the power that the cross 
provided when Jesus carried that cross. But today we live in a generation that brings division amongst people. I can tell you just this week alone, outside of our congregation, I had three different phone calls of people that are not even connected to the body of Christ. And they said, we, need to one, we would like to see if we can come and meet with you and talk to you about our loved one because of some of the things that they're going through in their life. And I, I shared with them, I said, listen, I'm no expert in the field of, of, of what your loved one is going through. But I said... I can share with you some of the road that I may have traveled, but I, I will tell you that, that a majority of what I'm going to share with you is going to be gospel because of what Christ did in my life. You see, we live in a world that the cross is separation for people that don't know Jesus Christ. And yet, when there's turmoil and trouble, sometimes the first place people will turn is where? They turn to the church, the significance of what the church is all about. The second thing that I see that we look at this story in Philemon is that the cross of Christ is a cross of decision. The cross of Christ divides you. You can't be neutral in relationship to the cross. You must be on one of two sides, either the cross of rejection or the cross of repentance and reception. And in Luke chapter 20, uh, 23, verses 32 and 33, it says there were also two others, criminals led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. You see, two sinners hung on the crosses with the Savior affixed between them. Center stage was the cross of redemption that Jesus hung on. On the one side was the cross of rejection and rebellion. He died without hope and without God. The Savior of the world was right next to him, but he refused to trust him. He rejected the only remedy for sin, the only cure, the only one who could grant him life. And on the other side of Christ was another cross, the cross of repentance and reception. And in Luke 23, verses 40 through 43, we find where it says that the other answering rebuked him. Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But the man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come in to your kingdom. What did Jesus say to him? Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. All the thief had was Jesus Christ. And church, that is enough alone, amen? The Lord Jesus Christ was all that this man needed. One of the phone calls that I received this week was from a mother who had three children and her brother had overdosed a month ago on heroin. She said, I, Pastor Dave, I, I, I feel lost. I feel like I've got no hope. I feel like I've got no direction in my life. My life is in a downward spiral. I was leaving the court yesterday, and I smashed my car, and I broke my foot, and I, I got, my life is just continuing to go downward. And she said, I, I, I got your number from somebody who knows you at your church, and I hope it was okay that I called you to talk to you. And this is how the opening of the conversation was. And I said, yeah, it's fine, it's not a problem at all. So I sat with her on the phone for over an hour and just talked with her and I shared with her, I, I said to her, and for the sake of her name, we'll just, we'll, we'll call her, we'll call her Ann. And I said to her, I said, Ann, I said, I'll just, I'll simply tell you that my life was changed when I realized that it was the steadfast love of 
a jail chaplain who talked to me about the love of Jesus Christ and about what the cross of Jesus Christ will do for me if I will come into a, a life of repentance. And I, I broke it down for her so that, you know, because it, it, the last thing you need to do is say, hey, you know, where you just you, you go to him and say, listen, you, you need Jesus, and if you don't get Jesus, you die, and you're doomed for a devil's hell. Well, that just opened up the bridge of communication that much more. But I, I kind of, I, as I worked with her and just talking her through some of those things, she, she, she was weeping on the other end of the phone, and she said to me, she said, Pastor Dave, I have no hope. And I simply just shared with her about the hope of Jesus Christ. Because that's what we need. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ is a cross of decision. We all have to make a decision in what we're going to do. Amen? Hallelujah. But all that thief had was the cross of Jesus Christ. The Lord recognized and acknowledged his faith and he promised him that before the day was over, he would be more alive than he ever was. Verily, truly, I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. The third thing that we see that I love about the story of the cross, it's a cross of destination. So you have the cross of decision, or the cross of division, cross of decision, and now the cross of destination. In Luke 23, 43, Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. As though two, two thieves' destinies, they were determined by their view of the cross of Christ. That day, both thieves entered into eternity. One went into the presence of Christ in paradise, and the other entered into a hell of torment. What you and I do with the cross of Christ determines where we spend eternity. It's the cross that determines our destiny. Our decision about the cross makes a decision for us about eternity. To receive the finished work of Jesus on the cross is eternal life. And John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave right to become the children of God, even to them who believed on his name. You see, to reject it is eternal damnation. John 3.36 says, He who believes in the Son of everlasting life and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him. You see, it's the reason that Paul states in 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, For I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen? You can look all around you right now. And let me just stop for a moment and talk to you about this particular subject. As we talk about the different crosses, as we talk today about what these crosses mean, I want to just stop for a moment and help us to really realize our focus here today. Where is your hope? Is your hope in the upcoming presidential election? Well, that was uh, easy confirmation through this body. Your hope and your eyes need to be fixed on Jesus Christ. If you're fearful about who's going to get into office, you've got your eyes on the wrong person. You need to have your focus on Jesus. Here's how my wife and I are praying. We're praying as we're looking at the number two man. We're looking at the number two. Look at the number two person. Look and see the values of the number two people that are serving under the current running of each party. Look at the values of those two individuals. Put your hope in nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Put your trust in the fact that your hope is not in man, but your hope is in Jesus, amen? 
But that doesn't mean that we don't pray. Amen? And so we need to understand that because our eyes need to be fixed just as we are approaching just a few weeks away that we want to be able to do our civic duty that God has called us to do. Amen? And I tell my wife that when we pray, we vote according to God's word. We vote according to the value of what God's word tells us. But we do our civic duty. But our eyes need to be focused and fixed on Jesus. Amen? We already know what happened, knew what happened when the people screamed for a king. And God let them have it. He let them have their king. And it didn't turn out too well. Read the story. and You'll see all about Saul. <coughs> but your eyes need to be fixed on Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. We need to know and understand that we don't trust in nothing less than Him. Put your eyes, fix your eyes on the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to read to you a poem that I found that was related to the cross. It's called, At the Foot of the Cross. Everything in my life that's hidden deep inside, I give it away for my Savior to heal. These fears that I have, that I've buried for years, at the feet of Jesus, my heart pours out in tears. As I kneel and pray, my thoughts become clear, and I finally see what's so very dear. At the foot of the cross, I cry out in pain, Anguishing thoughts pour out like rain. But amidst these tears, I find a peace so calm. As Jesus secures in, the darkness fades away. My heart is free, my mind once again sane. The past torments I've had are forever washed away. My life burns brighter like the dawning of the new day. At the foot of the cross, I'm loved and not lost. Where the holy drops of blood have paid off sin's cost. The Savior was taken, now risen once more. Through the grace of God, the veil was torn. The world was cast a new rope of hope, dangling freely from heaven, climbable by faith alone, to an eternal place where sin and death are dead. And it's at the foot of the cross life can be found, on your knees draped in blood, on Calvary's sacred ground. The cross of Christ is either a cross of division, a cross of decision, or a cross of destination. All three of them are relatable to our life. What side of the cross will we stand on? What decision will we make as we're faced with decisions in our life? I want to talk to you for a moment before we close in prayer. Something that's in your bulletin and on your church calendar. And it's on Sunday, October 30th. Sunday, November 13th. Sunday, November 20th. And Sunday, November 27th. On Sunday evening at 6 p.m. We're asking the church. I've already talked to the guys on our board. And I've asked all the guys on the board to be here for those nights. I'm going to be asking our leadership team to join us as well. We're opening the invitation for you too as well. But these are going to be nights of corporate time of worship and prayer. The theme for these nights are based on believing God for greater things. It's going to be based out of Mark chapter 11, verse 24. And I want to share with you for just a moment and tell you that these corporate nights of prayer is where we need to pray for God to give this church vision. Vision for decisions. Vision as we move forward. We need to pray 
I shared with you last week uh, this book that I was reading, and I, sh I shared with you a few excerpts from this book. There was a church in California that started a Wednesday night prayer meeting a number of years ago, and the pastor started with, I think it was a group of people that le was less than 30. And through the year that they've been holding those corporate prayer nights, their Sunday morning services are running well over 10,000 people now. Now, I'm not saying that could, you know, God can do anything. But it's bathed and based in prayer. And, and my wife and I, and we sat down with Jerry and Margaret last Sunday evening, and we said, if there was two of us, or if there was three of us, we're committed to whatever it's going to take for God to continue to grow the church, bring us together, bring vision to the congregation, and help us to get excited again about what it is that he wants us to do. Amen? And when I was preparing this message this week, I was thinking about that because the cross is where it all begins. It's where it happens. It's where it takes place. Our focus and our vision comes from Him. Amen? And so we want to extend the invitation and trust that you will join us those evenings and be part of what's going to take place. We're believing, and, 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 and let me just say this to you, that when revival begins in the church, it doesn't begin by scheduling services. Revival in the church begins by God pouring out His Spirit on the people. Read all about it. It happened in the book of Acts. It didn't happen by scheduling meetings and say, we're going to have camp meeting, we're going to have revival services. That's not how revival takes place in the body of Christ. Revival takes place in the hearts and the lives of the people when they get a fresh outpouring of God's Holy Spirit on the body and we begin to see miracles taking place seeing people that are healed, seeing people filled with the Holy Spirit, seeing great transformation taking place in hearts and lives, and people getting excited about serving Jesus and not the church building. Amen? All this week I had prayed that with our, these upcoming times of prayer, it, that we would have <clears throat> is that as Mary and I were talking with Jerry and Margaret, we were saying to ourselves that I think we have found, and it begins for me as the pastor, as the under-shepherd. God's the shepherd, by the way. I'm the under-shepherd. Okay? And it begins with us at the top and works its way down, is that when we, when we get complacent and know that, okay, hey, things are fine, we're just kind of coasting along, we're maintaining, uh, and we, then we become spiritually apathetic, okay? And you can't gauge your temperature in the body of Christ by a barometer of feelings. you got to continue to be desperate for an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. And when we were in the storefront, there was times of desperation because we didn't know from one week to the next how we were going to survive. And so Mary and I felt that it was very imperative, and, and, and when we sat down with, with, with Jerry being our elder in the church, um, he, he kind of smacked me around a little bit in a spiritual way. You know, it was good. It was good. Yeah. Yeah. It was th those times of encouragement, the times of challenge for me personally as a pastor. But if we're going to see revival, we're going to see an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, then we need to come together. We need to get back and know what the basics of the fundamentals are. And I told Mary, I said, you know, with the worship service this week, I wanted to go back and dig into those great choruses and hymns that built the church. Amen? And every, I mean, we're still going to do some of the other stuff, but 
for these next several weeks coming up, you're going to hear more of that on a, on a more on a more regular basis, but then the messages that are going to lead up to that, um, I'm really encouraged by where the Lord's taking me personally in Scripture. Um, but we have to, we have to know what side of the cross we're standing on. We got to know that we're standing with the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? I want us to get excited about our faith. And that's why Philemon was a great starter in this because he was a great encourager. Philemon reminded me of Barnabas. And, you know, when that letter was written, you know, Barnabas was a great encourager to the body, to the people. Amen? And we need that. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. And I pray today that the presence of your Holy Spirit, God, in these upcoming weeks, Lord, I help, I pray that wherever we may be at individually, help strip us down to that basic bare minimum again and rebuild us. Rebuild us up, God, with the foundational truths of what your word teaches us. And Lord, thank you today because as we look at the cross, we know the significance of what you've done by carrying the cross, that blood-stained cross of Jesus Christ. So Lord, I thank you today for your word. And Lord, I pray as we leave this place today, help us to revive us in our hearts and our lives. God, that we we'll just continue to be excited about our faith. And Lord, thank you today because I know that even this week in my own life, God, as you brought me to my knees, bring me to this place, continue to bring me to this place week in and week out. A fresh and a new, Lord, and, and Lord, as we continue to move forward in our faith and our journey, Everything we say and do, let it be about you. We'll give you honor and glory in Jesus' name.